statement the Secretary of State for Health. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, with permission, I would like to make a statement on hepatitis C and HIV infected blood. Mr. Speaker, what happened during the 1970s and 1980s when thousands of patients contracted hepatitis C and HIV from NHS blood and blood products is one of the great tragedies in modern health care. It is desperately sad to recall that during this period the best efforts of the NHS to restore people to health actually consigned very many to a life of illness and hardship. As the current Health Secretary, and on behalf of governments extending back to the 1970s, may I begin by saying how sorry I am that this happened, and to express my deep regret for the pain and misery that many have suffered as a result. It is now almost two decades since the full extent of the infection was established, and two years since the independent inquiry led by Lord Archer of Sandwell reported. The majority of Lord Archer's recommendations are in place, as are programmes of excretia payments administered by the McFarlane Trust and the Eileen Trust for the HIV infected and the Skipton Fund for those with hepatitis C. But significant anomalies remain, and I pay tribute to Lord Archer, to other noble lords and to honourable members in this place from all parties for highlighting them. In October, my honourable friend, the member for Guildford, announced a review into the current support arrangements to look at reducing the differences between the hepatitis C and HIV financial support schemes and to explore other issues raised by members during the recent backbench debate, including prescription charges and wider support for those affected. We also ask clinical experts to advise on the impact of hepatitis C infection on a person's health and quality of life and to consider whether an increase in financial support was needed. My honourable friend, the member for Guildford, met with representative groups to understand the impact these infections were having on people's lives. She also met many members in both houses who have been strong advocates on behalf of those affected. We have now considered the findings of the clinical expert group and accept that the needs of those with advanced liver disease from hepatitis C merit higher levels of support. At present, the amount of money paid to this group depends on the seriousness of the infection. There are two stages at which the Skipton Fund will make a payment. The first is when the person develops chronic hepatitis C infection. At this point, a person is eligible for a Stage 1 relief payment, currently a lump sum payment of £20,000. Some may reach a second stage of developing advanced liver disease, such as cirrhosis or cancer, or requiring a liver transplant. They then become eligible for a Stage 2 payment, which is currently another lump sum payment of £25,000. Under new arrangements we will introduce, this second stage payment will increase from £25,000 to £50,000. This will apply retrospectively. So if a person has already received an initial stage 2 payment of £25,000, they will now get another £25,000 lump sum, bringing the total £50,000. In addition to this, we will also introduce a new annual payment of £12,800 for those with hepatitis C reaching this second stage. This is the same amount as those who were infected with HIV receive. Those infected with both HIV and hepatitis C from contaminated blood will now receive two annual payments of £12,800 if they meet the stage 2 criteria. One payment for each infection along with the respective lump sums and all annual payments made, both to those uh, infected with HIV and those with hepatitis C, will now be uprated annually in line with the Consumer Prices Index to keep pace with living costs. Mr Speaker, we know that some of those infected with HIV or hepatitis C from NHS blood and blood products face particular hardship and poverty. Those infected with HIV can already apply for additional discretionary payments from the Eileen Trust and the McFarlane Trust but no equivalent arrangements are in place for those infected with hepatitis C. So we will now establish a new charitable trust to make similar payments to those with hepatitis C who are in serious financial need. These payments will be available for those at all stages of their illness based on individual circumstances. Discretionary payments will also be available to support dependents of those infected with hepatitis C, including dependents of those who have since died. Again, this will echo the arrangements in place for those infected with HIV and enable us to give more to those in greatest need. 
And we must also ensure that those infected through NHS blood and blood products get the right medical and psychological support. I can therefore announce two further measures. First, that those infected with hepatitis C or HIV will no longer pay for their prescriptions. They will now receive the cost of an annual prescription prepayment certificate if they are currently charged for prescriptions. Secondly, the representative groups raise the issue of counselling support for those infected with blood and blood products. We fully recognise the emotional distress they have experienced. As a result, we will provide £300,000 over the next three years, allowing for around 6,000 hours of counselling to help these groups. Mr Speaker, whilst we focus on those still living with infections, we must also recognise the bereaved families of those who have died. At present, no payment can be made to those infected with hepatitis C who passed away before the Skipton Fund was established. This is a source of understandable distress for those who survive them, and it is something we now want to put right. I can therefore announce that until the end of March 2011, there will be a window of opportunity where a posthumous claim of up to £70,000 can be made on behalf of those infected with hepatitis C who died before 29th of August 2003. A single payment of £20,000 will be payable if the individual had reached the first stage of chronic infection. Another single payment of £50,000 will be made if their condition had deteriorated to the second stage, where they suffered serious liver disease or required a liver transplant. We will work with the Skipton Fund and various patient groups to publicise this new payment to those who may benefit. These new payments, which will go to the individual's estate, should help more families get the support they deserve. Mr Speaker, taken together, these announcements represent a significant rise in the support available to those affected by this tragedy. Putting an exact figure on the package is difficult, but as there is some uncertainty about how many will be eligible and how their illnesses may progress. However, we believe these new arrangements could provide some £100 to £130 million worth of additional support over the course of this Parliament. All payments will be disregarded for calculating income tax and eligibility for other state benefits, including social care. And whilst these changes only apply to those infected in England, I will be speaking to the devolved administrations to see if we can extend this across the United Kingdom. Mr Speaker, today's announcements cannot remove the pain and distress these individuals and families have suffered over the years. But I hope these measures can at least bring some comfort, some consolation, and perhaps even some closure for those affected. I commend the statement to the House. Yeah. Diane Abbott. Yeah. Mr Speaker, on this side of the House, we welcome this review and we welcome today's statement. We note that Labour health ministers had agreed this review in principle before they left office. We're glad the statement was made on the very first day back after the Christmas break because we were aware that the statement was promised before Christmas. So we appreciate the statement being made as, as soon as it could be. The Secretary, will the Secretary of State agree with me, though, that this House owes a tremendous debt of gratitude to those patient groups who have campaigned for over 25 years on, these is on this issue? This includes the Haemophilia Society, the Hepatitis C Trust, the Tainted Blood Group, the Manor House Group, and individuals such as Hayden Lewis, who unfortunately passed away before he could see this, this resolution. Without the campaigning over two decades of these groups and these individuals, this issue would have been one of private misery and private suffering. It's because they campaigned and kept it before the public and kept it before the eyes of politicians that we're able, I think, to move decisively towards a proper resolution today. Will the Secretary of State also agree with me that although many things in the statement will be welcomed, particularly the help with prescription charges, the 300,000 for counselling, because the awful mental effect of this tragedy on people I have seen with my own eyes, the payments for dependent, the posthumous claims, and above all, the moving towards parity between HIV and hepatitis C, all of that will be welcomed. There will still be campaigners who regret that we haven't managed to achieve parity with the compensation that was offered and handed out in the Republic of Ireland. It would be silly to pretend there will be many people still not saying today why could not we achieve what was done in the Republic of Ireland. And finally, will the Secretary of State agree with me that when you remember 
that over 4,500 completely innocent and trusting patients contracted either HIV or hepatitis C or both as a consequence of this tainted blood and up to now over 1,900 of those people have died, leaving thousands of dependents behind, should we not as a House resolve that it should never again take 25 years for perfectly innocent victims of errors and mistakes to have proper justice and recompense? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am um, grateful to the Honourable Lady and I entirely endorse um, both her opening and closing remarks there, um, both in um, uh, paying tribute to all the patient groups. And my, my Honourable Friend, the Member for Guildford, has um, uh, met uh, many of those groups, many of those individuals, uh, and she, I know, would heartily endorse uh, what the Honourable Lady has said in terms of how they have um, brought these issues time and again to the forefront of um, attention in this House and in the other place. Uh, and, but I don't want to underestimate. There have been many in this House and in the other place who have responded to that uh, and done so very well in bringing these cases forward. And I, I do hope that they will see in today's statement uh, a proper response to that. Um, I, I entirely agree also that uh, we don't know if there will ever be a similar case of this kind. I hope we can avoid it. It's much better to avoid it. But if we were ever in a situation where a consequence of this kind had flowed from the NHS seeking to do its best to try and treat patients, but nonetheless this kind of harm had occurred, that we would recognise that and be able to identify that and not allow decades to pass before proper recognition had taken place. But that does bring me to the substantive point the Honourable Lady made, which is the relationship between what we are doing here and the nature of the compensation provided in the Republic of Ireland. As we explained in October, um, we don't regard these as comparable cases. In the Republic of Ireland, there were mistakes made by the uh, Irish Blood Transfusion Service, which uh, led to a recognition of liability, which leads to a um, determination of compensation. In this country, we are not providing compensation. We are literally recognising the harm that has occurred, notwithstanding that the NHS at the time um, sought to provide uh, the treatment that it thought was in the best interests of patients. Um, that harm occurred as an ex gratia payment and in recognition of the harm that has occurred and the distress that has followed. Um, we have sought to ensure there is proper support, um, both financially and otherwise, for the, family, for the uh, victims and their families. And I hope today, by, bringing, um, um, uh, by, by getting rid of the anomalies and recognising in particular through the work of the clinical expert group the impact on those with hepatitis C, we are now having, we're arriving in a position that is genuinely um, giving the support that those people who were damaged should expect. Jonathan Evans, Mr Speaker, whilst welcoming the statement that's been made by my right honourable friend, I think I should just make the point that uh, Lord Archer did recommend, however, that there should be compensation along the Irish line. So that's a little bit of the context of what's taken place. May I take the opportunity of congratulating also his uh, friend, the Honourable Member for uh, Guildford, for all the work that she's done in relation to this, which I know has been welcomed across the House. Can I ask him about the specific position in Wales? I was a little taken aback by the fact that he said he intends to speak to fellow ministers in Wales. I have a statement from the Welsh Minister indicating that, as far as she's concerned, these issues come next to be considered by her in 2014, which was the previous agreement with the Department of Health. And I think many of my constituents will want to know what discussions have so far taken place and whether this is something that will be replicated in the Principality. Uh, I'm grateful to my honourable friend, and uh, my uh, honourable friend in, on the front bench will have heard what he said. I'm grateful for it too. Uh, can I just say, I am, I am speaking on behalf of England in this respect. As uh, the, uh, the Department of Health, uh, we uh, currently administer the uh, payment system. Uh, we had to reach decisions. We've made decisions. We intend, always intended to do so as rapidly as we could for England. Um, but as I explained in my statement, uh, these decisions have yet to be made by de the devolved administrations. I think it is reasonable on their part for them to see the review report that I am publishing today, not least the clinical expert review that goes with it, in order for them to make their own decisions. But it will be decisions that they must make, but clearly from my point of view, if they wish us to continue to administer it on the same basis across the United Kingdom, we would be happy to do so. 
Diana Johnson. In the debate in the autumn on this subject, the Parliamentary, Secretary, Parliamentary Under Secretary of State agreed to speak to her colleagues in the Department of Work and Pensions about the changes to benefits and how this would affect uh, people who'd received contaminated blood products. And I wondered if the Secretary of State could now give any guarantee about passporting these people with the new changes in benefits so they don't lose out and have to go through uh, a further set of medicals. Uh, I'm, I'm grateful for that. Um, if I, if I may, it's not precisely the question the Honourable Lady is asking, but there was, uh, Lord Archer did also ask a, uh, make a point about whether the payments should be uh, through the Department of Work and Pensions. Uh, I have to say, we see no tangible benefit that would flow from that. No, no, I, I did acknowledge that. <laughs> um, I will, of course, respond to the Honourable Lady, but as, from, from my point of view, I think it is better for us um, to administer this, all of these payments through the, um, the system that I have set out. Um, as I said, they will be disregarded for the purposes of um, calculation of benefits. So to that extent, they will not impact adversely on their current benefits. Jason McCartney. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Having spoken in the debate back in October and having asked the question in Prime Minister's questions in November, I'd very much like to welcome uh, a number of elements of the Secretary of State's uh, statement earlier, particularly on the free prescriptions uh, and also the counselling help. However, would the Secretary of State uh, perhaps uh, promise to uh, meet the tainted blood campaigners and perhaps even think about looking at the overall level of, of compensation? Could I say to my honourable friend um, uh, two things? Firstly, um, my, my, my honourable friend, the Minister, has met those groups and I know will uh, continue to um, uh, meet them because it's, we want to ensure that, not least, that those who are going, now eligible for enhanced payments and so on um, do make proper applications for that. But I have to say to the honourable friend, as far as, as far as we are concerned, we have looked very carefully with the clinical expert group at the nature of the um, support that we ought to give. Uh, it is not compensation as such. It is an excretia form of support. Uh, we have made judgments. If we were to go further, there would be significant additional costs involved. I've made clear to the House, or my honourable friend and I have made clear to the House in the past, that to provide payments on the scale of the Republic of Ireland could be um, up to three and a half, perhaps even in excess of three and a half billion pounds a year. So I'm not in a position to say to my honourable friend that I expect to be able to go beyond the level of support that I have set out today. Mr Andrew Slaughter. Uh, it's to be regretted that, the, uh, that in, in producing this review the terms of reference were so narrow and it didn't look at overall level of conversation and at, at HIV. But if, if the Secretary of State is saying that in the case of the Republic of Ireland it is simply too expensive, then please will he say so and not rely, as, as the Department has previously, on either that the tainted blood campaigners and others are asking him to, um, are asking him to look at the, uh, that as, as tying us to the Irish system or asking us to uh, effectively look at those levels of compensation because there's negligence involved because that wasn't the case in Ireland. Isn't the result of this like to be more litigation because these levels of remuneration are still far too low? Okay. Well, with respect to Honourable General, I think, uh, with respect to the Honourable Gentleman, I, I think in response to previous questions, I made it very clear that I wasn't saying that it was about simply the question of the amount of money, that it's actually the, the, the Republic of Ireland situation is a unique situation in respect of the determination of liability on their part because of mistakes made by the Northern Ireland blood, oh, the Irish Republic of Ireland Blood Transfusion Service. Uh, to that extent, we are making ex payments. I have to say that the, the nature of the payments we are making, I think, stand comparison with other countries, um, both in, uh, particularly so now, um, with, in respect of hepatitis C on the basis of the announcements that I've made this afternoon. Jenny Willett. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Um, I really welcome this statement um, today, particularly the apology, which I think will go a long way to um, ease some of the pain that some uh, of the victims have suffered. Um, and proper support for those affected with hepatitis C is very long overdue. Um, Gareth Lewis, um, who was a leading tainted blood campaigner and I believe has met the minister in the past, um, tragically died just before Christmas, only a few months after his brother Hayden, who was mentioned by the, um, the spokesperson for the opposition. Um, which highlights the urgency of my question, which is this. Um, government is not known for moving quickly, particularly when it involves handing out money. Um, will the Minister today reassure us that everything that is possible will be done to make sure that the payments that have been announced today will be paid out as soon as humanly possible? Yeah. Yes, can I pay tribute to my honourable friend, because I know that she has 
uh, on, many cases, on many occasions in the past spoken up on behalf of her constituents and others who were affected um, by, tainted, uh, by the blood and blood products provided. Um, the answer to the question is yes, we, absolutely we will. Um, uh, we've acted, uh, we, we came, when we came into office we were determined to implement the review. We made it clear that we sought to, as the Honourable Lady said, we sought to complete the review before Christmas. I think technically speaking we did complete the review before Christmas but we're not in a position to announce it before Christmas. Um, so we're doing this at the first available moment and I do urge one of the things we will do is do everything we possibly can to ensure that those who are potential beneficiaries will be notified and reached as quickly as we possibly can so that those payments are in place as quickly as we can. Chris Bryant. Thank you Mr Speaker. One of the greatest catastrophes would be if this were ever able to happen again, which is why it's so vital that the government constantly keeps under review the policy on um, donating blood. The Secretary of State will know that one of the categories of people who are not able to give blood at the moment is men who've had sex with men. And whilst that seems intrinsically unfair and prejudiced, can I urge him in the review that is ongoing into that only to look at the evidence, the scientific evidence, because that's what we should make the decision on, not any other political consideration. Um, yes, I entirely agree with that. Andrea Ledson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I have to say I'm, I am a bit disappointed. I'm, I'm not sure that this, um, that this announcement today will give closure to, to many people. And, uh, and in particular, a constituent of mine who told me about a, a very good friend of his who died in Spain over Christmas, and sadly, uh, his family couldn't afford for his body to be brought home, so he had to be cremated in Spain. And I do think it would be very important under the circumstances that um, the ex gratia payments available through the new charity that's to be set up will take into account the very tragic and very particular problems of individual sufferers. Um, yes, indeed. Uh, I'm, I, I know they will because that's one of the reasons why we wanted, in addition to the, uh, the lump sum payments and the annual payments that I've announced, uh, ensure that in addition there was scope for discretionary payments that would be based on individuals' needs. Elfin Hluid. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Can I take the Secretary of State back to the point raised by the uh, Honourable Gentleman for Cardiff North? Um, it's rather surprising that there hasn't been any discussion with the devolved administrations hitherto. Can the Secretary of State tell the House whether it is anticipated that such payments, if they are to be made in Scotland and Wales, are to be made out of existing budgets, or how will, will this be handled? Um, what I've announced today will be, of course, funded out of the Department of Health budget in England and would be a responsibility for the devolved administrations in relation to their budgets. And it is from within the budgets that have been set through the spending review. Mr David Trudinick. I too congratulate my right honourable friend and his parliamentary under secretary for all the work that she's done in dealing in, and this statement which deals with what Lord Archer called the worst treatment disaster in the history of the National Health Service. But it has to be said that the last Labour government could have dealt with this and didn't deal with it. Can my right honourable friend give assurances um, following this comprehensive package which he's announced that he will make sure, take active steps to contact the families of the bereaved and that there will be no stone left unturned to make sure that all of those who should have payments receive payments. Uh, yes, indeed, I can give my honourable friend that assurance. We will take all steps that we possibly can, um, not least, of course, for those who were um, uh, the bereaved families of those who died before the 29th of August 2003, um, because uh, that has been, uh, amongst others, an anomaly which has really ought to have been rectified long ago. Mr. Owen Smith. Thank you, Mr Speaker. May, may I also welcome the statement, welcome in particular the very serious and uh, commendable way in which the Minister of State has dealt with this important issue. People who really need to be congratulated today, though, are the campaigners, people such as the family of Lee Sugar, my constituent in Wales. Um, may I take the Secretary of State back to his comments about this applying to England only and ask him to explain the rationale for that, because the previous schemes have, of course, applied to England and Wales, albeit that they predated devolution. Is he saying that there will be no additional funds available for Welsh patients under the Barnet Consequentials to provide a similar funding in Wales? Um, I, I share the view of the Honourable Gentleman. It is today, actually, the people who should, be, uh, who, who should feel that uh, we are expressing our support are those families, those victims, those who 
uh, uh, those who've been harmed and their families. Those are the ones we're really supporting today, and I hope they will feel, if, if not everything that they have hoped for is being provided, that we are at least making a very substantial progress uh, and doing a great deal to show a recognition of the harm that occurred to them. Um, so far as the position, I, 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 at this dispatch box, I, I speak on health matters for England. I don't speak for Wales. Uh, I, I'm not in a position to be able to say what the decision of the devolved administrations are in, uh, in other countries in respect to this. I have set out what we're going to do in England. Uh, we are funding it from within the budgets that have been allocated, so there are no Barnet consequentials that flow from this. So these will be matters to be determined within each of the other administrations as to whether they wish to share in the arrangements that I've described. Mr. Adrian Sanders. There can't be a member of this House who hasn't got at least one constituent affected or, or knows somebody affected by this. And uh, I'm sure every member in this House would like to congratulate the Government on uh, today's statement. Can the Secretary of State give an assurance that the bureaucracy that will be needed in order to process matters forward has been looked at in order to keep it to a minimum? Um, Yes, I can, I can say to my honourable friend exactly we have done that. Um, can I just say, it would be helpful, I mean, he's absolutely right. Members in this House very often will themselves have met um, constituents or con uh, the families of those uh, who were harmed or indeed the families of those who died. So I do hope that they will take the opportunity to bring uh, the uh, terms of this statement today to their attention so that they can access the additional support at the earliest possible time. We will seek to do it, and, and I think what I'm describing so far as possible builds on existing mechanisms, so doesn't lead, with the exception of the new discretionary trust, doesn't uh, create any additional bureaucracy in order to make it happen. Order. I'm very well aware of the strong interest of the Honourable Member of Coventry North West in this subject and his track record on the issue in the House. The reason why I haven't called him, and I wasn't intending to call him, is that as far as I'm aware, the Honourable Gentleman was not here for the start of the statement. If I'm wrong, I'm very happy to concede I'm wrong, but if I'm right, that's the way it has to be for today. The Honourable Gentleman is a very experienced parliamentarian, and I'm sure he'll find other ways to make his point when he wants to make it. Dr. Lee. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, can I first welcome the Secretary of State um, for his statement today? Um, during the debate in October, I, I drew attention to the figure that was quoted of three and a half billion um, pounds that the, the Irish compensation scheme would, would cost, and I, I was concerned about the accuracy of this figure. At the time, on the, in the, 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 uh, this was placed in the library, and it to justify it, it had indicated there had been informal discussions. I've since found out that that was a telephone call that was unminuted. Uh, when I pointed this out, it was, I was assured that there would be further conversations with our, our Republic of Ireland officials. Could he confirm that those took place? And if there are details available, could they be placed in the library, please? Uh, I'm grateful to my honourable friend. He, um, he, he will know from the response my um, honourable friend, the Minister, gave to the backbench debate in October that. Um, we intended to place a note in the Library of the House. Uh, we have done so. She has held, had further occasions with uh, colleagues in the House to discuss these arrangements. As far as I'm concerned, the, um, uh, the discussions between my officials and officials in the Republic of Ireland have confirmed that uh, a figure of about £750,000 is not inappropriate as an estimation of the um, level of compensation per individual paid in the Republic of Ireland, which of course on that basis um, would support the view that we took in this House that the cost of providing compensation were one to do so on the scale of the Republic of Ireland would be of the order of £3 billion, in excess of £3 billion. However, I, I do say, as I said to um, the um, Honourable Member from Ealing previously, um, that uh, it is not on the basis of the cost um, alone uh, that we have reached this view. In fact, it is on the basis that the circumstances in Republic Ireland are unique and do not apply in this country. And therefore, we have assessed the case for support on the basis of the circumstances here and on an ex gratia basis, not on the basis of liability and consequent compensation. Stephen Barclay. I also thank the Minister for... Um the very welcome measures in the statement and the progress that's been made after so long. Can I just come back to that average figure of 750,000? Because there's a concern that potentially that is uh, confusing the average and the mean. 
to take a figure between 500 and a million and say that is the average um, is not actually an average figure. It, it's akin to saying the average of a car ranges from £10,000 to a million pounds, therefore the average of a car is half a million pounds. Could I just, just ask, the, uh, in terms of the discussions that the Minister's had with officials in Ireland, could I just ask him to confirm that the total paid in Ireland is less than a billion pounds sterling as the total payment in terms of Irish settlements on this matter? Um, as, as with my honourable friend in the previous question, I do pay tribute to the work that my honourable friends have done in support of their constituents and others. Uh, can I just say, um, I, I personally don't think, uh, I, I think it is not simply a question of trying to calculate what the level of compensation is in Ireland. That is not the issue. The issue is we are not making a comparison with Ireland. Uh, we are making a judgment, um, and we have especially in this case now done so in relation to hepatitis C on the basis of the report of the clinical expert group to try and assess the level of harm and the consequences that have flowed uh, from the um, uh, from the transfusions that took place, uh, even, albeit that in this country the NHS did so on the basis of its best efforts to provide the best possible care for patients. In the Republic of Ireland is a unique case and is quite distinct from that in that um, because of mistakes made uh, a finding of liability was arrived at which leads to compensation. In our case we are not um, in that position, we are in the position of recognising uh, the harm and distress that has occurred and through an ex-gracious scheme providing support to, the, um, to those who have been harmed and their families. Yeah. Mr. Hames. Thank you Mr Speaker. I'd like to thank the Secretary of State for bringing the Government's deliberations on this issue to, to this conclusion. Can, can he reassure this House uh, that those experiencing the symptoms of advanced liver disease uh, who receive contaminated blood will not in all cases be required to have a liver biopsy in order to demonstrate and establish their eligibility for these payments? Um, no, for, from our point of view it will be, simply be on the basis of a diagnosis of their condition. Mr David Mowat. Thank you Mr Speaker. Um, I too welcome this statement, in particular the attempt to get parity or better parity between HIV and hepatitis C. <laughs> Uh, the issue that remains for me, though a little bit, is the definition of stage 2. I would ask the Minister what proportion of hepatitis C a complainant does he expect to progress to, to a stage 2? He must have estimated this to have a financial uh, amount on the, on the settlement. Um, I, I regret I can't give an, uh, an estimate to my honourable friend, which is one of the reasons why the, um, the nature of the estimate I've given is a range that extends from 100 million to 130 million during the life of this Parliament. And indeed, the, if one were to go beyond uh, this Parliament, the um, parameters of that range would widen, not least because we cannot know to what extent, we do not know to what extent this illness or this infection is likely to progress to the second stage of the diseases. Charlotte Leslie. Thank you very much. Um, I very much welcome both the, uh, many of the contents of what's been said in the statement today and particularly the fact that um, this decision has been made to actually force closure on an issue that's been going on for so long. One of the things I think that's upset so many of the sufferers who've been affected is not only the fact that such a scandal happened, but the subsequent um, failings, as they would say, to the Department of Health, um, not governments, but the Department of Health over those years, to be clear and transparent in providing information from what actually happened. Um, can the Secretary of State um, give his assurance that he will um, be happy to provide and help those people who are still affected when they ask questions, perhaps freedom of information about the occurrences in the past? Um, can I um, once more um, express my thanks to my honourable friend for the way in which she has um, been a forceful advocate in these matters? Um, the answer to that is yes, and not least, I think, because actually my honourable friend, the Minister, uh, has been very open, very willing to talk to uh, everybody concerned uh, and she will continue to do so because we are determined to give people confidence not only that we have exercised what we believe to be a responsible and a reasonable judgment in these matters but we are doing so in an open and transparent fashion.